Hey, this is Pastoring in the Digital Parish, your resource and point of connection for building digital ministry strategy and bringing your congregation into the digital age. My name is Ryan Dunn. I'm the proctor for this podcast, which really seeks to be the digital ministry class that you just didn't get in seminary. On this episode of Pastoring in the Digital Parish, we're welcoming back Charles Vogel. We just spoke with him a few weeks ago, and during that time, Charles talked about a couple things we decided we needed to follow up upon. First was that there's a loneliness epidemic in our society, and that's a clear need spiritual communities could be addressing. So we wanted to follow through on that and keep in mind how we can utilize digital spaces to facilitate meaningful connection. Charles also mentioned that it takes a bit more effort to build real relationship in digital spaces. So we wanted to follow up on some principles on facilitating valuable community connections. Throughout this episode, Charles also offers practical advice and insights on how to build a community that nourishes everyone's need for connection. As we begin, let me remind you of our sponsor and a super helpful resource for building thriving communities in ministry. It's called Safer Sanctuaries, Nurturing Trust Within Faith Communities, and it's a new and comprehensive resource that continues the tradition of safe sanctuaries ministry by building on its trusted policies and procedures. So to learn more about that, go to safersanctuaries.org or you can give them a call, 1-800-972-0433. All right, let's get to know a little bit about our adjunct professor for this session once again, Charles Vogel. He is an advisor, a speaker, uh, the author of three books, including the international bestseller, The Art of Community, which was our lead into talking to him. He's been drawing on 3,000 years of spiritual traditions, and Charles teaches the wisdom and principles that he learned there to build deep community and resilient relationships that foster innovation and integrity within organizations and around the world. Charles has an MDiv from Yale, where he studied spiritual traditions, ethics, and business as a Jesse Ball DuPont Foundation scholar. His work is used to advise and develop leadership and programs worldwide within organizations, including Airbnb, LinkedIn, Twitch, Amazon, ServiceNow, Meetup.com, Wayfair, and the U.S. Army. So with all that said, let's get into part two of our conversation with Charles Vogel here on Pastoring in the Digital Parish. Charles, I want to back up our conversation. This is a kind of a two-parter that this has turned into for us. Um, And I want to go back to really where we started the last conversation, because I feel like there's so much more for us to explore there, especially in terms of how we think about the role of church leadership moving into the future. And you started off our conversation by talking about loneliness and how it's really Mm -hmm. an epidemic now. And then I kind of glossed over that because I wanted to get into some practical stuff. So let's back up to that loneliness epidemic. Mm -hmm. Why is it? Why are these feelings of loneliness that we're encountering in this day and age such a big deal? So unfortunately, that's a really big topic, and there is Mm -hmm. no single answer to that. So when I'm talking about this, people looking at this for the first time, I point to big three trends that we've noticed in our culture. The first one is that Americans are moving, physically moving uh, where we live. Uh, more now than I believe in any generation before, but certainly more than a generation ago. I don't have the exact Hmm. statistics in my head, but Americans are moving something on average of five times as an adult. And obviously there's a bell curve there, but the point is it's a meaningful number of times. And every time we move, we separate ourselves from the people are connected to any given place and in many ways start over. Yeah. Uh, The second thing that we look at in trends is uh, certainly since the 1970s, Americans are largely leaving their home faith traditions. Now, uh, unfortunately, they're often leaving for very good reasons, and there's been a lot of ink used to write about that. But uh, for this conversation, we'll just notice that Americans are leaving their home faith traditions. What that means is uh, Americans are largely not gathering regularly with people in a cadence uh, and meeting with people that they ostensibly share some values and purpose with as Americans did in the late 20th century uh, during the baby boomer generation. And then lastly, a trend that we see that is really the elephant in the room is the use of social media. 
Mm. Uh, we know that social media is correlated. The increased use of social media is correlated with being more unhappy. And um, I'm a big believer that as we spend time with so in social media, uh, there's above zero one-to-one -one ratio of time we're not spending building relationships uh, in the physical world. Okay. And my understanding is that research in about 2013, so you know, about 10 years ago, but the, the truth of it has probably not changed, uh, an increase of connections on social media does not lead to a happier life. Whereas the research is overwhelming that friends in our actual lives, in our actual neighborhoods, uh, does improve our lives. We are more happy. So if we're spending more time in a medium that's not making us happy and we're spending less time creating relationships that make us happy, you can see where that you know, over a lifetime that leads to some pretty um, uh, unwanted outcomes. Yeah. I, I think about um, friendship in terms of like somebody who I can call to help me move or something like that. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, social, certainly social media does not offer uh, that depth of connection mm -hmm. or at least that accessibility of connection. Um, mm -hmm. But it does provide a, um, not a feeling of connection, but it does uh, provide a point of, of invitation. Uh, you've talked about, of course, the first point of community as being invitation. Um, social media can, can be that place, I think, or, or at least digital uh, forums can, can be that place. And one of the interesting, I guess, avenues that you have lifted out is, is Twitch. Um, Twitch is kind of an interesting case because it can both put distance between people, uh, but also you've looked it up that it, it can connect people as well. My teenage son is into Twitch. I know a number of our listeners have mm -hmm. a presence on Twitch. And uh, again, you've noted that Twitch can, fill us, can facilitate some connections. So what can we learn from Twitch's community building practices that uh, might help us to fight against the, the tide of loneliness in mm -hmm. a sense. Yeah. Well, just to be clear, I haven't really tracked uh, Twitch's evolution in recent years. Mm -hmm. There was a time when I was talking quite a bit with some of the guys there, very influential in what Twitch looked like and how it was developing. And I can talk about some of the lessons that I think are well known, at least in certain circles. Uh, they're not, as far as I know, proprietary. You know, one of them is we need to distinguish between uh, different kinds of relationships. And when I'm talking about creating friendships, I'm talking about relation, uh, relationships where the connection goes both ways or said differently. Uh, in both directions, there's an understanding that the other person understands us intellectually, understands us emotionally, and accepts us who we are. And very often in Twitch relationships or any kind, there's a broadcaster. Uh, that's what we call a broadcast relationship where there is somebody who is sending out media and other people may follow that. And they may feel connected to that uh, personality, but it doesn't go both ways. And that's not bad, but that's yeah. not the type of connection that my work is talking about. And that's not the kind of networks of relationships that we need to build to get out of our slide of isolation. Okay. Uh, one of the things that Twitch recognized and we talked about quite a bit and that I know that they specifically support is this understanding that in communities – People have different ro roles, and one of the ways we can understand them is different rings of maturity in every given community. And this directly applies to ministry. So uh, I may go into a room, and let's say that's a barbecue, and it may look like it's just a bunch of members. And that's what someone who has no education and no a trained eye about what's going on may see. But to someone who's trained, they say, no, 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 some of us are visitors. And we don't know the norms, and we don't know the names of the people who are here, and we don't know how things are, are usually done, and we don't know what we have permission to do, and we're just trying to figure that out. Mm. And some of them are full members, and they know that people expect them to be there and that they've had some kind of initiation. So they understand that, uh, of course, they're supposed to be here, and they can uh, learn and participate fully as opposed to being visitors. And there are other people who uh, are what we call elders – and they understand that their job there is to provide leadership at some level in how things are going to play out. And they have some moral authority on what's the right way and the wrong way to do it here. And if they're really mature, they understand that their job, or at least one of their jobs, is to help the newer members grow 
in whatever way they want to grow. And in Twitch, that is um, offer on video games. And then there's the, what we call for the purposes of understanding this, principal elders, the people who have the most authority um, and the most um, wisdom about whatever we're trying to grow around and about. And very often the principal elders are often the deciders of who can be in and out of the organization or the community. Um, we call those gatekeepers. And then when we look at the elders <clears throat> who understand their roles to help members mature, very often they can play gatekeepers, meaning they can say, look, you shouldn't be here. You're not interested in what we're interested in. You're not interested in helping. Or um, let me help you come through the gate of the ring of being part of this community. And when Twitch understood that, then they could change the privileges allotted to certain members of any subgroup to play these roles. And so then communities, subcommunities at Twitch could grow in ways that didn't just overwhelm the broadcaster. They could have people support them. Hmm. And, they, and the software was built to specifically do that. And Twitch could then look at any given community and notice who, if anybody, are playing these roles, and do they have enough, and how are we supporting them to have enough people play those roles, to have people feel connected they show up, as opposed to waiting to the attention of just the principal elder. Oh, okay. That, um, that, there's a lot of ideas there. I don't know if I overwhelmed you, Ryan. Are, uh, I am a little overwhelmed. Well, okay. I would love maybe, to know. Maybe, little... maybe cut that all out if you want. Um, the way this <laughs> applies to ministry is when we have people show up in our ministries, we need to understand that someone who's visiting for the first time is having a very different experience and has very different needs than someone who's been coming for six months. And if we want to get them involved in our ministry, they almost certainly need to meet an, need to meet an elder in that community. It could be a ministerial community, community that is taking the time to show that that person is seen both intellectually and emotionally, and they're accepted for who they are right now. And then they get an invitation to another experience where they will also meet somebody who will demonstrate that they see them intellectually and emotionally. And we call that person, that elder who provides that experience, a gatekeeper. They're mm -hmm. helping someone cross into the gate of the community. And we have to identify those people because if we don't have gatekeepers for people to meet, then they don't get connected. Yeah. Which is to say... Everybody at the barbecue is not having the same experience. We can't treat them the same. Mm, all right. That makes total clarifying sense. <clears throat> I understand it now. And, and um, I think naming that uh, intentionality in terms of identifying these roles in, in building community is, is hugely important. I think it's something that a lot of us in the church world, we just kind of default into and assume that these things are going to happen organically. Yeah, yeah. they just and, hope they get lucky. I mean, they don't say yeah. they hope they get lucky. They're just like, we'll just make burgers and it'll all work out. Well, it'll yeah. work out if you get lucky. Right. Um, I'll yeah. give you an example. I was part of a, a weeknight ministry here in Berkeley, California at a local church, and I was going there for a couple of years. And uh, at this particular service, this weeknight service, it was open to everybody. If anybody come off the street for reasons you understand, they could come in. The problem was there weren't other events that we could invite regulars to that were more intimate, where we had a boundary where it wasn't just anybody could walk in all the time. Or said differently, we couldn't create a space that was safer, where the conversations could go deeper, because it was always what we call an outer ring experience. It was the ring that you would come to if you're a visitor trying to figure out, like, what's going on here, and do I like you, and do I like this, and do I want to go back? And that's fantastic. You need to have outer ring events if you want people outside your ring to figure out if they want to join your community and be inside the ring. But if you only have outer ring events, then you never have the safety to have the deeper, more emotionally intimate conversations and experiences because you're stuck at an outer ring event. And yeah. that minister who was running that uh, either didn't want to spend the time to create inner ring events or didn't care to listen to me when I said – your um, participants are desperate for a int more intimate experience mm. and um, got results consistent with that. Yeah. Well, it's scary to do the inner ring stuff. I've, I've been thinking about it in my own context. Like it, it's easy to have the outer ring event, um, but that vulnerability that is mm -hmm. involved in the inner ring event is 
is intimidating to a lot of people. Um, I, do I don't you... think it needs to be. You know, for example, Ryan, you go to Thanksgiving, am I right? I um, actually in the last few years, no. <laughs> no okay, it hasn't happened. Yeah. Are there any family but, holiday you attend? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, certainly, yes, there are, there are family experiences or even large group experiences. I mean, I'm involved mm -hmm. in a church community and we have just what you've talked about. We have our, our barbecues and our, mm -hmm. um, our arena level or invitation level events there for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, my point is that most people don't want to go to a family holiday, be that an Easter, uh, Easter brunch or a Thanksgiving dinner where every time anybody who's walking by can come in. Yeah. Right? At mm -hmm. some point, th there's a line that says you need to be in our family or connected to our family or be invited by someone in the family who wants you to be there to be here. And if every family holiday event and birthdays and anniversaries were, no, 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 if you just see that we have hot dogs, you can come on in and stay. Those events will start feeling um, less protected. And the, the kind of conversations families can have when they know that everybody – is here because they're part of the family or support of the family aren't going to happen. Right. And those are outer ring events. And so that same is true of the ministry. After I've been showing up for six months, I, I want to have conversations that aren't the orienting conversations and that level of superficiality to make the deep mm -hmm. relationships. And they don't need to be big, right? They can literally be over pizza, but they need to happen. Well, you've been engaged in this work for several years now, both pre-pandemic and now post-pandemic. Have you sensed that there's a little bit more of a resistance against those those deeper level events now that we're into the post-pandemic era? Where I mean, are, are people just so hungry for it? Enough research to know what's really going out there. It's a big country out there. What I find when I'm traveling is people writ large are so ignorant of what it takes to create context where people can connect mm -hmm. that they're spending a lot of time and inevitably money making events where people almost certainly can't connect. And I don't remember what I shared in our last conversation. Cause that was some weeks ago. You know, I have several examples where I went to events where people spent a lot of money and a lot of people spent time attending and they set them up so that we couldn't connect because they were too, too loud or, um, it, it wasn't clear who we we're supposed to talk to. Uh, for example, Ryan, you know, I'm a big fan of name tags. If, if there's a group of people that you want to gather and connect, if that's what you want to have happen there, I don't know why you wouldn't have name tags. Because, uh, Ryan, if I want to leave, remember your name is Ryan, it's going to be really helpful if I see your name is Ryan when I'm talking to you. Full stop, right? Um, and there's a resistance to that. You know, fair enough. If you don't like name tags, you don't like name tags. But you're supposed to, you're trying to bring people together so they'll leave and they'll be friends. And they don't, they literally don't know one another's name you know, after two hours, because you didn't give them a chance to do that. Uh, I go to places where people are there and somebody wants to put on a movie or they want to play music so loud it's hard to talk. And there's this like thinking like, well, that's more festive. Okay, it may feel more festive. It's also literally working against the activity you want to have happen, which is I want people to get to know each other enough. They want to see each other again, right? And feel known and seen. <laughs> um, I can go on and on. And I just, it kills me when I see people gathering and they want to, to connect. They, they want support doing that. And the person hosting is, is ignorantly creating it in such a way where that, if that happens, it's because they got lucky. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just, I'm wondering if uh, we as leaders and facilitators mm -hmm. of community, if we need to invest in um, helping people feel a sense of openness and vulnerability and trust where they do want to move to that next level event. Or, or if we're living in a time when people are just like, I'm okay being anonymous and just part of the crowd. Well, first of all, Americans are not okay with it. And that's clear mm. in the research, right? Yeah, and okay. quite frankly, we can look at the most morbid of statistics and that's our suicide rate. Hmm. Now, I, I don't think we need to wait until someone is, has suicidal ideations where we say, wow, this is a problem. We, there's a ministry opportunity here. But mm. we're at a place where the suicide rate is horrifying. And uh, you know, talking to people who are connected with the DOD, uh, I hear that it's even worse than we think it is for a number of reasons. And, it, and we think it's horrifying just with the public statistics. It's just a freaking nightmare, Ryan. And anybody who mm. says, well, people really like to be alone, like I'm sure that's true some places, and our culture is – literally killing ourselves. And, and, and to those who think that's hyperbolic, 
the top tier universities of this country are spending literally mm. tens of millions of dollars to help their students not kill themselves. I'm not saying like address mm. depression or try to make them feel better. Literally keep their students from killing themselves. And these are our kids in the top educational institutions of our culture. Mm. And, and that's – an expense that is just considered a, a requisite line item of a top tier institution in this country. Okay. So it's just silly for anybody to say anything, you know, against that. Now there's a bell curve on how people respond to connecting with others' invitations, and uh, you know, according to Mar uh, Marissa King's work, um, she's now at Wharton. On any given group, you're expecting about a third of them to want to connect with people. Uh, a third. Uh, largely want to stay home and watch Netflix and read books. And then a third um, want to connect, but at some point there's a tipping point in how connected they are, and then they, they pull back. And so if you're hosting events, your experience of that is, is, gee, they were interested and they were coming, and like now we don't see them much, they're not that involved. So uh, that's just kind of the context, if I understand her work correctly, which is to say if there's any given N, you mentioned Twitch earlier, you know, there's over 150 million Twitch uh, members, you know, of that, out of 150 million, we would only expect 50 million to be really responsive to an effort to connect. Um, and even out of that, I really believe we have to, as people who are creating ministries or creating events, really expect a Pareto distribution and participation. And for those who don't know, that means that about 80% of your yield is going to come from 20% of your participants, 80% mm. of volunteering, maybe 80% yeah. of your donations, 80% of your, uh, you know, um, you know, bringing food, like whatever it is. Yeah. Which it's is a church say, rule. It's like, yeah. Yeah. 20 so which is to say it. if you yeah. have 500 people in any given group, like we're only talking about really getting a hundred people really involved and you may do better, but don't beat yourself up for only getting 40% involved. Hmm. Right. And I talked to a lot of organizations who understand year. that. And so let's say they get the 49, you know, number and they beat themselves up for their failing. And I'm like, no, you don't understand your double high five territory. Yeah. You just hit a home run. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we need, we can respect that there's a bell curve there with that said, um, you know, those who are in that bottom, let's just call it 66%. That doesn't mean they don't want to talk to anybody. That doesn't mean they don't need connection and they don't need um, relationship that create more resilience for them and the challenges of life. And, you know, I have hundreds of friends at this point. I, I don't say that lightly. I mean, like actual friends that I can call right now and they would help me if I asked for it. I'm also, you know, way out in the bell curve. Uh, but for other people, you know, six friends is a major life changing experience. Mm -hmm. In fact, we know half Americans don't have more friends. That's horrific, but that's where we are in America, which is to say if you and I create a ministry and it looks like, let's pick someone, Scott doesn't come very often, but our ministry has helped Scott have two people in Scott's life Scott can call when Scott gets a bad diagnosis, that is life-changing, and we don't need to question whether Scott really got, only got to know two people and only came one third of the time, whether we have failed in our ministry. Mm. Because yeah. in a country where half people have do not have four friends, making two friends because you're participating in ministry is legit life changing. And when you have kids involved, uh, we're talking about shifting more than one generation. Mm. Yeah, and I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's the need that we have within ministry to to be aware of now. Um, perhaps it, it even paints a picture of what professional ministry might look like in the future where, I mean, it might be risky to say that we're going to let go of uh, like theological study. I'm not saying that we're going to get rid of that, but a focus might shift on to something like companionship and, and mentorship mm -hmm. um, just to be that kind of elder person who ushers somebody through these concentric rings of, of belonging. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Ryan, because I think that a lot of people in ministry that I've met, you know, they've put in the time to, often officially get credentialed in ministry, be that graduate work or not, or chaplaincy yeah. credentials. And there's an enthusiasm with exegesis, right? Or homiletics. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. Yeah. You know, God bless you. Yeah. Uh, but there's a reason that the lot of us went and spent years learning exegesis and everyone who's coming to our barbecues did not. Mm. <laughs> and I think that 
I, I've seen this happen before where I think that there needs to be a humility pill that people don't want to sit and listen to us show how brilliant we are because we did all the reading and can think smart, right? <laughs> they only need enough that yeah. feeds them, right? They don't need us to death. I, you know, I've saw some preaching recently. I was like, man, there is way too much thinking going on for this uh, Oakland, you know, East Oakland inner city church you know, sermon that needed to happen because nobody is leaving this room remembering that. Right. And I don't yeah. even understand how it's relevant. But wow, did I get that you can use a lot of words? Yeah. And yeah. so when really all the people want is to know the person. Yeah. Or they just want. Um, to get a new perspective that helps them relate to their life in a way that's more meaningful and helpful, right? Mm -hmm. And as long as they get that, that's enough. So there's two things I want to speak to that. The first one is um, when we bring people together, um, we know that as communities uh, emerge, and I'm taking this out of the research that looked at longstanding spiritual communities, uh, there needs to be three components, or we can name it as three components, and that there needs to be head heart and hand experiences. And what I mean by head is the head is that exegesis, right? And the parsing of whatever we want to parse. Great. I'm glad that's part of it. Hmm. But head isn't enough. At some point we need the heart and the heart is simply that emotional experience. What is emotionally going on in this experience as opposed to, is that a deft use of words and references? And when you talked about vulnerability, inviting people to be vulnerable, that's a heart experience when someone chooses to share that kind of emotional vulnerability. And then thirdly, the hand doing something. And uh, that can be volunteering, but it can also just be um, building something together or um, preparing a meal together, but physically doing something that isn't just talking about emotions and thinking things in our head. And I think a lot of people in ministry, uh, their training is thinking and writing. Mm -hmm. Often talking, and so those la those latter two parts, which are requisite, uh, don't get any attention or, or get inadequate attention. And then the other part I want to say about this, besides the head, heart, and hand uh, areas that have to be there, is ideas we really need to notice: what do people need, as opposed to what's convenient for us. And you know, I, I, everybody listening has heard of Teresa of Calcutta, right? Uh, she is not famous for her evangelism, right, and her deft exegesis and homiletics. <laughs> mm. um, she's famous for finding sick people and caring them, often caring for them, and often caring for them until they died, and then finding more people who need care. She f knew, because they were sick, what they needed, delivered that, and that was a totally valid ministry. And when we're doing ministry – in the loneliest era, maybe of people, I think it's pretty clear amongst the things what people need, and it's not to show off how deft we are with fancy words. Hmm. Um. Yeah, depth there. All right. Thanks for laying it out there. <laughs> That's good. Good. Uh, and you know things that we know on a cognitive level, but oh, it is so deceptive when you take that class on, like, I don't know modern hermeneutics or something that I want to floss everything that I just learned uh, when people are looking for, uh, yeah, just a, a deeper level yeah. of connection in terms of relating to a person. Well, when I was in divinity school, it was a common phrase that divinity school teaches you how, how to teaches you so you can never talk to other people mm. because the, huh. the vocabulary buy-in you needed right. for the intro conversation was out of the grasp of virtually everybody else in our lives. Right. And yeah. Then, you used course, the word exegesis. The first time I heard that, I was like E X O J E S U S. I'm like, why are they cutting Jesus out of meant. everything? Yeah. I didn't know what it meant when I heard the first, I remember <laughs> I, anyway. And Sorry. then I think there's a, like a, a switch flip and said, okay, great. Literally turn around, walk out the door and go talk to people who don't have this vocabulary and be effective. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I met quite a bit of people who can't cross that bridge. Right. They're still stuck yeah. in the other side there. And I think, and, and I went through this journey myself. I think part of it is getting the confidence that says the confidence so that we know we don't need to show off how many smart things we did learn to be actually effective in the world. And here's the truth where nobody cares. Mm. Yeah. If they want to hear fancy talk with fancy words, there's a podcast and a book available for them for free somewhere.
and they don't need it from us. Um, well, we've talked uh, quite a bit about church specific stuff. I want to broaden uh, our, our conversation to some of the other the communities that, that you work with. Um, specifically, you've talked about working with brand communities and, um, and we can unpack what that means a little bit, but um, building a, a community with a larger organization or, or a brand per se requires a, a little bit of, of trust. Um, and so I, I'm wondering within this age where people are just a little bit slower to move from one level of relationship to the next, like what are some ways that, that organizations build trust at large so that they can facilitate a deeper community mm -hmm. and connection? Well, the fundamental there is you and I, Ryan, don't want to be connected with any people, be they connected to an organization or not, who are disinterested in our welfare. Hmm. Uh, we keep showing up, be it a church, be it a political organization or a commercial organization, because we think that people there are helping us grow in the way we want to grow, which could simply mean do something that we think is important, right? Yeah. And if the organization's attitude, no matter how it's worded, if the actual attitude is, gee, we just want to extract from you as much as possible, eventually mm. that will leak out, mm. right? And Ryan, I know exactly how many weekends you want to spend next year with a group of people whose only interest is how much stuff they can get from you, be that time, attention, or money. Right. Even I can count that high. Yeah. Exactly right. So when you say how to build trust, well, the first is um, answer the question, um, how do I want the people who are going to give me their attention to grow in a way they want to grow? Mm. And then... Um, what will support them in doing it? And then when that's demonstrated that there's uh, that commitment, there's a now a foundation of possible trust. And what very often proves it, proves the trust is worth it, is when the organization will make a choice which either is not a maximum yield for the organization or actually is costly for the yield in order to hold the integrity of that commitment. So I'll just give an example uh, from one of my Twitch days when I was talking to the Twitch guys. Uh, you know, Twitch is not a perfect organization, and everybody I talked to Twitch will agree with that. So please don't, mm -hmm. you know, confuse yeah. this as picking an organization that has done everything right. But it's a good one, and I wrote about it in my book. Um, Twitch uh, at some point made a, an upgrade to their software, and they destroyed an archive of very important videos to a very important community of Twitch, and it was all gone. And it was a total mistake. And uh, it would take several engineers weeks to do it, and it was unclear at the beginning whether they could do it. And I remember Marcus Graham, who goes by DJ Wheat, was uh, an executive at Twitch at the time, and he told me how he immediately got on their uh, socials and started broadcasting that this was a mistake. Um, we made it, and we were working on it. And we don't know how long it'll take to fix. And um, he told me that that experience gave his team and the organization a lot of credibility because they didn't try to explain it away or just go silent because Twitch is going to make their money no matter. But they, they realized they had harmed a certain community that wanted that back. And they invested real engineering resources to get that back instead of just saying, that's old, we're upgrading to the new and we're moving forward. Mm. And by showing that they weren't perfect and that they were going to invest in solving problems that they had created, that gave them credibility that he would say later when other things went poorly, uh, gave them some wiggle room in trust with their followers instead of the followers just assuming they're a, a greedy tech company with maximum expansion who will steamroll anything in their way and then holding the task for that. Hmm. Just a quick aside, I'm going to jump in here with a reminder that this season of pastoring in the Digital Parish is being sponsored by a group that takes community building seriously, Safer Sanctuaries. Safer Sanctuaries Nurturing Trust Within Faith Communities is a new and comprehensive resource that continues the tradition of Safe Sanctuaries ministry by building on the trusted policies and procedures that have guided churches over the past 25 years. This resource contains theological grounding 
for the work of abuse prevention, psychological insights about abuse and abuse prevention, basic guidelines for risk reduction, age level specific guidance, and step-by-step -step instructions on how to develop, revise, update, and implement an abuse prevention plan in your church or organization. For Christians, we know that resisting evil and doing justice are ways that we live and serve Jesus. Safer Sanctuaries provides help to do just that by framing this work as life-giving, community-enhancing, and a proactive endeavor. It enables communities to be empowered and flourish as they develop and implement policies and procedures that make everyone safer. To learn more, go to safersanctuaries.org or give them a call, 1-800-972-972. 0433. Check them out and build a little more care and safety into your community. And now we're going to get back to the other principles of community building with Charles Vogel. So is, uh, I guess, transparency and vulnerability uh, an important part for the organization to relay as well? It is. Vulnerability starts getting a little bit squirrely because some people interpret vulnerability as just dump your insecurities uh, mm. into the ether. Yeah. And that's not vulnerability. That's, uh, that's dumping. Um, often it's whining. So when we talk about, um, you know, Brene Brown is the most famous scholar and speaker on vulnerability. And what I respect about her work is she says that you need to measure your vulnerability uh, in ways that are culturally appropriate. And so uh, the vulnerability is important. She describes vulnerability as um, sharing things that you're afraid if others knew they would reject you. And that's why vulnerability is scary because there's this fear yeah. of rejection. And if it doesn't feel scary, it's not real vulnerability. So um, the vulnerability is important because it, sh it shows people that we are aware that we're not perfect and that it will let them see that we're not perfect. Um, and when we want to create a space where other people will be vulnerable, and I mean above zero, I don't mean that we invite spaces where people dump all of their trauma every time they show up right away. Um, it's very important that we as the host uh, go first. Mm. And I can't tell you, Ryan, how many times I've been to some kind of leadership retreat or workshop and they say, oh, this is the, the leaders will say, this is a safe space. We're all safe here. They never define what safe means or how it's safe. And they say, and you can be vulnerable here. And then they fade to black. Mm. And what they've said in their example is we want you to be vulnerable here, but we're unwilling to be vulnerable here. So we just want to see if you'll do it. And if it works, it's because you got lucky, because there's someone here more sophisticated and brave than the hosts that yeah. create that space. So if there's a space where we want people vulnerable, we need to show that it is, in fact, a safe place to be vulnerable by going first. And then if someone breaks the safety of the space, say by attacking, we need to reset the boundaries and show that it is, in fact, safe. And I've seen that fail, too where someone says, I want to be vulnerable, and someone's vulnerable, and then they get attacked, and then nobody holds down the, you know, the rules, and then, well, that ended. Yeah. Mm. So it is important, Ryan, but if we are going to create those spaces, we understand what's required there. And I know when I'm leading my workshops, and someone, and I invite people to share something, and it, there's an opportunity to be vulnerable if they'd like to. For example, I don't say, who wants to talk? Or who has this interesting story? <laughs> Or who wants to speak to this? I don't say that. I say, who will be generous and brave and share whatever I'm inviting them to share? Hmm. And this way, when someone does speak, let's say it's you, Ryan, you're not raising your hand as someone's like, I like to talk in rooms. <laughs> you're now sharing where the context has been set. Oh, Ryan would like to be brave and generous. Hmm. And then because I've done that, Ryan, no matter what you say, and it might be terrible, right? You might stumble a lot. You might want to tell us about family members who are sick, but it doesn't come out well because you know, mm -hmm. you're so uh, upset about it. It doesn't matter now because I've already framed you as brave and generous. And I can say, you know, Ryan, thank you for being brave and being first. And it sounds like this is still really upsetting to you. Mm. And what I've done there is I've taken care of you I've shown that you're going to be protected when you step forward in that vulnerability. And that's a signal to everybody else. Like, ah, if I come forward, this is, I'm actually going to be taken care of instead of like, hope it works out. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen yeah. that fail in rooms over and over again. Yeah. They just, they just I believe we all have, and, and yet pray. we still don't, yeah, we yeah. still don't learn the lesson. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been helpful to, um, to kind of have these specifics called out for us. This has uh, mm -hmm. been some proactive leadership type stuff. Um, I, and I do have, I guess, just one final question for you. Um, we're having this conversation because your books were recommended through our community by members of our community. So you've talked about some of the research and resources that, that you've called on. What are some books or, or research or resource <laughs> spots that you might recommend for us? Well, um, you know, I've specifically wrote my books for the community, I believe, that's listening now, right? People who are in yeah. ministry. And, and one, of the books, one of the books is called Building Brand Communities. And I want to be clear, a brand in my work is simply an identifiable organization that promises value. Yeah. So that can and be think, spiritual, commercial, yeah. social, artistic, political. It doesn't matter. Um, so it does apply to people in ministry. Absolutely. Yeah. I just and, want to second that, that I believe that churches are in – in a broad sense, brand communities who fit the criteria that you just mm -hmm. lifted out there. Yeah. Yeah. Not all churches are promising the same value, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them uh, lead services in Spanish and some lead them, lead them in Korean and they're not the same. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to my work, which is uh, been read, which I wrote specifically to support people, bring people together. Uh, one of my favorite writers on this is Marissa King. And her book is Social Chemistry. It was released just a few years ago. She did such a fantastic job really surveying the research on, um, first of all, how lonely we are, and then the, what differences it makes when we connect, what we need in place so that we do connect, and then what I think is really important, um, the kind of people who connect us. And she articulates three different kinds of hubs. Uh, cause not everybody who connects people do it in the same way. And if we do it in the wrong way, we actually create something toxic. I won't go into that here, but she does a fantastic job about that. And then Priya Parker's job, uh, the art of gathering, I think is a required reading for anybody who's going to spend real time and real money, bringing people together. Um, so those are two, those would be the next two books I would turn people to. Cool. All right. And, and I asked that with a specific thought in mind that, um, we're here doing this podcast about pastoring in the digital parish and leading in digital mm -hmm. spaces. And it can be very enticing to try to put the the medium before the actual practice where, mm -hmm. you know, we get excited by the new technologies and the possibilities that it might open up without being intentional about the core issue that we're trying mm -hmm. to build, build community. So, uh, so putting in mind these, these avenues that we can research that really help us to focus on the relationship building aspect and not just the technology building aspect is I believe crucial for mm -hmm. our, our community. So thank you. I'm glad to be here, Ryan. Yeah. And thanks again for being gracious to, to come back and speak with us once again. Um, anything on the horizon that you're excited about that you want to share? Yeah. Uh, this October, um, I'll be leading a full day workshop at my home parish, uh, Oakland City Church, which is in East Oakland. And this is going to be the first full day workshop I'm leading for ministers, both lay and ordained. And uh, we're inviting many parishes uh, to send lay leaders and ordained leaders to participate in that. And we're hoping we start something, something that, uh, you know, echoes. So if anybody uh, would like to join us in that, um, you can reach uh, my team at my website, charlesvogel.com. That's charlesvogl.com. And we'd be very excited to invite others to participate. And then my team is looking forward to creating full-day workshops for ministry professionals and ministry volunteers around the country. And we know that um, getting a full-day commitment for somebody is a lot. So we understand that if we come to a city and we can make broad invitations to many, many parishes, then we can fill enough room, enough people in a room to make that worthwhile and hopefully really shift the needle on a lot of ministries. Cool. That is going to put a wrap on this session of Pastoring in the Digital Parish. If you want to check out the previously mentioned episode with Charles, it's called The Loneliness Epidemic in Building Meaningful Community. Another good episode to follow up on this one is called The Importance of Branding for Ministry. We just talked a little bit about branding and trust 
And the episode I just mentioned goes further into depth on that. I'm Ryan Dunn. I would like to thank resourceumc.org, the online destination for leaders throughout the United Methodist Church. They make this podcast possible. And they host our website, which is pastoringinthedigitalparish.com, where you can find more online resources for ministry. I also want to thank Safer Sanctuaries for their support. Again, Safer Sanctuaries, nurturing trust within faith communities is a new and comprehensive resource that continues the tradition of Safe Sanctuaries ministry by building on its trusted policies and procedures. This resource contains theological grounding for the work of abuse prevention, basic guidelines for risk reduction, age level specific guidance, and step-by-step instructions on how to develop, revise, update, and implement an abuse prevention plan. Speaking of community, if you want to connect with the Pastoring in the Digital Parish community, well then check out our Pastoring in the Digital Parish Facebook group. You can also send me questions and ideas for future sessions at digitalparish at umcom.org. Another session comes next week. In the meantime, peace.